like to talk, as <laughs> has been said, my name is Andre. I'd like to talk about scaling data frames. And um, you may have noticed this blog post on the Stack Overflow blog last year in September, where they talked about why is it that Python is actually so popular these days, because that wasn't the case just five or six years ago. And they found out that one of the main reasons uh, for this is the is the growth of the of the pandas package they even added this nice chart we can see for example django being pretty much st stagnant over the time period with pandas numpy map up and the whole uh pydata e ecosystem um emerging and um a lot of the talks over the past two uh, two days have been on uh, machine learning ai and uh, and other technologies that basically build on this on this, uh, on this sort of baseline of, of pandas and other technologies. So we sort of take these for granted because these are some sort of data, uh, data containers and uh, data manipulation mechanisms that we don't really talk about uh, anymore uh, because we get, we've grown so used to them. So before we get to the whole scaling part, let's just talk a bit about what are data frames and why do we like them. So I presume that everybody here uses data frames, or at least the vast majority. So uh, I don't really want to explain. I just wanted to give my uh, give my take on why I've enjoyed using them over the past five or six years. So, as you all know, these are in-memory data structures. Uh, so this is sort of uh, implicit, and now I guess explicit <laughs> comparison to uh, how we think of, uh, for example, SQL databases. So, so these offer uh, a lot more flexible schema. So, for example, if you uh, if you want to do all sorts of transpositions and pivots, it's a lot easier in data frames. There is a very nice. Uh, Domain-specific language. So while SQL as a language is uh, is very nice and readable, uh, this programmatic access to data in data frames is, uh, has uh, has a lot of uh, benefits as well. Also, the UDF, so user-defined function. So in 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 data frames, you can use the the power of Python to basically manipulate it, your data as you want it. Uh, you can do a similar thing in uh, in the various uh, various implementation of SQL, but these languages tend to be a lot more limited. Uh, and also a lot uh, harder to debug and extend. Uh, there's no runtime, there's no connection pools, no maintenance. It's really, it all lives within the process that you run, so it's, uh, it's a lot more flexible in this, in this way. It's also, all the data is, is stored uh, per column, which, which uh, offers very efficient columnar processing, uh, which we'll get to uh, in a minute. It's not tied to specific data, so meaning that Pandas doesn't really care where your data is because it loads it, loads it all into memory, into its own uh, format. And you can also combine multiple data, data sources, which is, again, you can do in SQL, with, for example, in Postgres with foreign data wrappers and uh, technologies like these. Uh, in Pandas, you can, uh, it's, it's a lot more extensible because you can have some data from CSV, some from JSON, some from data, a database, and uh, combine them together. So these are some of the benefits and some of the things that we like about data frames. But uh, there's this thing that a lot of people uh, get to, is that we, we do tend to use functions like read CSV, read JSON, and, and, uh, and other methods to get our data, data into data frames. But uh, similar to the graph where, 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 where it showed the explosion of the popularity of pandas, if you showed, for example, the average data, uh, data set in, in terms of size, you would see a, a similar graph. So the, so the size of data has exploded over the past few years. And um, so if you do a read CSV on a, uh, on a 100 megabyte CSV, it's not a problem on a regular laptop. But once it gets to 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, you're going to start to struggle. So over the years, I've faced this issue uh, multiple times in multiple uh, areas, multiple domains. And I've, uh, I've tried uh, several different approaches to, do, to, to overcome this. And there's one thing to emphasize: there's no one-size-fits-all solution. So some people try to claim, "Oh, this is you know this is your data frame API that that works for everything," but there's there are always downsides, and I want to be clear on that, and I want to uh, explain what they are uh, for each of the technologies that I'm going to be talking about. Um, right. So these are the solutions. So one is not something that you subscribe for. So the one, the first one is actually not scaling at all. It's actually just changing your code to, to avoid all that pain. The other one is scaling up, so also known as uh, vertical scaling, so getting a beefier machine. Scaling the data source is also quite handy, which is basically just uh, improving the, the source of the data and to do all the, not all, but many, uh, much of the heavy lifting. And the last part is, has been quite popular over the past few years, and that's just actually using distributed systems, so horizontally scaling by adding nodes to your, um, to your system. So the first point was actually not scaling, so changing your code, so not actually not scaling up or out. The reason for this is 
Pandas is fast, so Wes McKinney, the author, has, has done a lot, of, uh, a lot of optimizations that you don't really see when, you, when you're uh, working with Pandas day to day, but there's actually a lot of work that, that, that went into this. Uh, but the thing is, the problem is, well, us, when, we're <laughs> when we write, write code and we try to manipulate individual data points uh, and writing slow code to do so. Um, so when you're working with data frames and you try to apply your own code to do some manipulations, you always have to uh, keep in mind that all the columns are stored in a columnar fashion, and um, it's, uh, it's really good to, uh, to use uh, vectorized functions. So this slide is more about the, uh, the compu compute-intensive workloads. The other one is going to be about, uh, about memory-intensive memory workloads. So in terms of uh, CPU-intensive workloads, uh, if, you, if you treat the columns as, uh, as basically vectors of values, then it's going to speed up your code. I've seen, I've seen speed ups of, uh, of 100x even more. Uh, so we've seen people looping through their uh, individual values of millions of values in, in a column and applying some simple, functional, uh, simple function to each value and then saving it back. Whereas if they use syntax like this or working with the columns as a, as a whole, uh, suddenly they went from a couple minutes to a couple hundred uh, milliseconds. Uh, and also, if you're if you're doing a lot of retrieval from your data frames and just saving it back, again with uh, with a little bit of modification, then you should maybe consider not using data frames uh, data frames for this workload and just taking uh, taking it out and then reconstructing the d data frame once your work is done. We've done this uh, many times and also we've seen uh, 10x, 100x uh, performance increase in that. So that was C that was CPU pressure because you know as you know there's 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 uh, a variety of uh, variety of performance problems. So that was CPU pressure. This is more about the memory pressure because, as you know, the uh, pandas loads the whole data frame into memory. So at that point, you you can ask yourself, do you actually need all that data in memory at once? Because you know, if the data set is 100 gigabytes and you've got a run-of-the-mill laptop, that's not going to happen. So there's a few questions that you ask. So do you need all the data in memory at once? Oftentimes the, the answer is yes, but uh, sometimes it's no. Uh, the second point is, do you actually need all your data? Because sometimes when you've got, when you don't need like a, let's say, a sum of, uh, or count of visits per client per, per day or something like that, then you need all your data to, to do that. But times you just need to know what's my, what's the correct uh, character, what are the characteristics of my, of my data set? What's the, um, I don't know, error rate if you're looking at, at your logs or something like that. So you don't need all your data for that. If you've got a correct sampling mechanism, then you can get away with just looking at, uh, at some samples of your data. You have to be very careful to sample correctly, so otherwise you're going to be inducing bias into your analysis by uh, only selecting uh, some data and not, not other. And the third point is, do you actually need all your columns? Because um, oftentimes that's not the case, and you can actually throw away a lot of data whilst you're loading your data into your data frames. So if you look at the, the documentation for read CSV, there's, uh, you can use only specific columns. Uh, and if you don't need all your memory, uh, all your data in memory at once, you can actually just specify chunks of data that you're going to be reading one at a time, and then you're basically looping over chunks of data, and you can process hundreds of gigabytes of data on a on a regular laptop. Uh, so that's uh, that's useful, for example, when you're doing some sort of filtering, and you're just going to want to want to uh, export your, uh, a subset of your data into a different one with some light processing. And last but not least, there's data types. So uh, Pandas is a lot more efficient with memory if, if your data is, is saved as primitive types, so primitive types being, being all your, or your floats and ints uh, and these sorts of uh, data types. So then Pandas stores it in a, in a NumPy, NumPy array, which is very efficient. Whereas if, you, if you've got strings, lists, and objects and that sort of stuff, then it stores a pointer to a Python object. There's you know, boxing and everything, and it gets very bloated, bloated very quickly. And also there's um, categor categorical types, which is basically, um, so if you've got a column that can only ha attain a limited set of values, so for example, like a country, uh, then you can set it to be uh, categorical. So instead of you know, saving pointers to, to the strings for each, for each value, it actually, for each value, it stores like a number. So it just says, oh, the Netherlands, number one, Czech Republic, number two, et cetera, and then just stores the numbers uh, in a NumPy array. So, and you can do that whilst you're loading your data if you, if you set it as categorical, or you can do it once the data is loaded. There's a, there's a few methods to working, uh, for working with categorical data in Pandas. And now for a bit of heresy, do you actually need Pandas for your, <laughs> uh, for your, for your, for your work? Because 
so I used to work as an analyst, and I used Pandas day to day because it's it's got a very nice API and it and it, and it worked great for all my in memory needs. But now now that I work as a data engineer, I'm a bit more aware of the resources that my code utilizes, and um, Oftentimes, I realize I don't need the API, I don't need my data in memory, not even chunks of it. I can do the processing uh, in a streaming fashion. Uh, again, this is not for every workload, but for a lot of workloads, uh, it can be the case that you don't really need Pandas, and you can, you can, you can even use the standard library in Python, which includes uh, gems like collections and error tools. This is in the, Pandas standard li uh, in the Pan Python standard library. So in case you haven't checked that out, uh, be sure you do, because uh, it's got very nice uh, uh, functionality for, um, for data processing and lazy execution, that sort of stuff. And I've seen, seen people use Pandas as a, as a CSV reader, as a very, very powerful CSV reader. So if that's, uh, that's all you want, that there's the CSV package in Python. So let's get to the actual scaling. So it might sound a bit amusing that I'm actually suggesting that you get a beefier machine, but uh, I used to work at this company a couple of years ago. We didn't have laptops; we only had workstations. And uh, once upon a time, I got you know double the double the RAM. I got a faster SSD, and uh, I got to do my work uh, a lot faster. It was a couple hundred euros that that was spent uh, on me, and I didn't have to have a virtual machine running to do my analysis. And it it, it amortized really, really quickly. So it might be costly up front, but if you've got a, you've got a system that's easily extensible, so it's not like a, an ultrabook, but if you've got a workstation, this is something that, that, that can actually speed up your analysis uh, a great deal, and you're not gonna be spending a lot of money because you can burn through a lot of, uh, a lot of cash on, um, uh, in the cloud. So that's the, that's the local scaling, and now let's get to the more interesting remote scaling. Uh, and by that, I mean, I, I mean getting virtual private servers. So, so who here uses Jupyter? And who has deployed Jupyter other, some, in some other instance than your laptop? Okay, so there's, 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 there's quite a good overlap, so uh, just tell me if I'm, if I'm saying something that you, that you already know. But um, this, is a, this is a method that's very, that's very useful if you, if you wanna do some ad hoc work. Uh, and uh, you don't want to. And for example, you don't have a DevOps team. Uh, launching virtual private servers has gotten a lot easier over the past few years, and it's a very elastic solution. It's got it's gotten way better billing at this point. So I'm, I'm here. I'm noting billing per hour, but you can actually get per second billing on uh, AWS and uh, GCP and on Google. You get very fast internet. So for example, if you if you're processing data, for example, like Wikipedia dumps and other. Uh, and other external sources, then uh, you're gonna you're gonna have uh, a, a lot better network performance than on your machine, and you can even get some savings if you're on secondary markets and stuff. So there was a discussion about this just a few weeks ago, uh, when somebody suggested, "Oh, you don't actually need your big fancy distributed systems because you can actually get a machine that's got a terabyte of RAM on uh, AWS, and it's actually not even the beefiest machine. I think you've got you can get up to like four terabytes of RAM uh, in some cases." But then there was another good point by John Miles White from Facebook that, yeah, that's all cool, but once you get beyond the, the terabyte, which is, uh, it's gonna get a lot more complicated for you, so you're gonna have to change your workload. So there's you know, pros and cons to every solution. So in case you've ever uh, tried to deploy anything on AWS, this is, what it, this is what it looks like, and it looked even worse just a couple of years ago. And you had to configure a lot of things like what are you know what are subnets you know your IAM roles and shutdown behavior what sort of storage you want do you want block storage do you want uh, SSDs etc. And even if you just click through it and just go yeah 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 I want that you, you're not going to be able to SSH into it because you don't have a port for SSH open so it's uh, it's a bit it's a bit tricky if you if this is not your uh, your daily bread but uh, gets the work done. Then uh, DigitalOcean came to came to be just uh, just a few years ago, and uh, they simplified it to this. They basically say, "Oh, cool! I want four gigs of RAM and two CPUs. That's fine. Eighty gigs of uh, SSD, and I'm going to pay twenty dollars a month. Whereas in you know EC2s, you have to you're sort of charged for for every every subsection of your uh, so you know for for your storage separately from your compute, etc. So this was uh, suddenly." Basically, anybody could deploy a machine and, and run the analysis on it. And uh, it was basically a revelation for quite a few people. 
Amazon realized this, and uh, this is their uh, their offering as well. So this is this is uh, AWS Light Sale, which is uh, a similar similar offering to DigitalOcean, which is you can launch EC uh, basically EC2 instances with predefined defaults, uh, fairly same same defaults uh, for um, for your ad hoc work if you don't have a DevOps team. So you've got your virtual private server. What do you do now? So I would recommend just using certificates, not passwords. So for example, by default, DigitalOcean will ship you a password in, in your email, which, by, uh, which has to be changed once you, once you log in, actually forces you to do so. But once you get to certificates, that's, uh, that's a lot safer solution. Yeah, obviously, you need to add your, or you should add your user, uh, et cetera. And once you install Jupyter, there's, uh, there's at least two options that you can use it. So you can actually just you know, go to your, the IP of your, of your machine, uh, specify the port, and luckily, as of a couple of versions ago, well, if you installed Jupyter just two, three years ago, it would just you know open up. So if somebody was port scanning your, uh, well, if somebody was port scanning the the IPs where VPS gets uh, get deployed, they could get your you know wide open Jupyter instance uh, right then and there. So luckily, they introduced tokens. So once you launch a Jupyter, uh, once you launch a Jupyter instance. It sort of requires you to enter this one-time password, uh, so there's at least some security. But it, but still, it's a, uh, it's all over HTTP, so it's uh, it's not encrypted. So whilst you might be thinking, oh, I'm just sending code back and forth, actually the results of your code actually get get shipped as well in the JSON that is the IPython notebook or the Jupyter notebook. So it's better to secure it. So either you can you can set up HTTPS on your server, or this is actually my favorite solution, and that's SSH tunneling. So what you can do is you SSH into your machine, and you tell it, uh, and you tell your local machine, oh, if you if you want to reach this port, actually ask this machine that I've already authenticated into using certificates and everything. So it's going to go through. So all the so all the traffic is going to go through. Uh, it's going to go through secured SSH. But you're you're just you just, you just have local hosts in your browser, but you're actually reaching your your power, powerful server in the background. Last but not least, you can you need your your data to to actually work on. So there's a, there's a few options. Uh, very good option is is object storage, so things like uh, S3 or Google Cloud Storage, I think it's called. And uh, it's extremely cheap for uh, for a lot of workloads. Uh, for a terabyte of storage per month, you pay something like twenty dollars, and you can get even cheaper if you don't access it frequently. Uh, the only thing you have to worry about is uh, egress, so the traffic outside of AWS or your provider in that case, because that can get very expensive very quickly. Uh, they usually provide free traffic or cheap traffic within the ecosystem. So if you launch, if you want to use S3, I would recommend using EC2s for, um, for your compute so that you get uh, free traffic between the two. You can also get other, other solutions like block storage. Uh, uh, I won't get, in, get into that. So, so that was scaling up uh, remotely. Uh, this is actually an odd one, but it, it worked great for uh, in a couple of instances. It's actually scaling the the data source that you're accessing. So this allows you to still work on your laptop, but crunch uh, terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data uh, without breaking a sweat. Well, your laptop's not going to break a sweat; some other machine will. And um, you can use this simple function of read SQL query, where you just specify a connection to your to your beefy database in the background and a SQL query, and it's going to return you a data frame that you can work on. So you get all your data types because it's usually some uh, some schema on write database, and but obviously you get limited EDF support because this is all depends on the on the data on the data store that you have in the background, and uh, you need to adapt the pipelines in terms of. Uh, you can't just do you know read CSV and then you start filtering etc. So at this point you have to do all the filtering and aggregations within the the SQL query because you can't be shipping the terabytes of data onto your laptop. You you're, you're sending back an aggregation, which I'm going to get into. And you probably don't want to use your everyday database like a uh, like a Postgres or MySQL though you could and we have and it is is still quite powerful. But if you want to if you want to scale out a bit uh, a bit more, there's uh, there's specialized technology for that. So. So what you have to do is you have to do some sort of sampling or aggregation or aggregation and then sampling, um, because as I said, you can't ship the terabytes of data. But 
uh, it works. It works very nicely. I I realized that we could do this once we are so we were, we were working with with Teradata and Redshift, and we were just running queries and just saving it as CSVs and then loading into pandas, and then we realized oh we can just do that in one well uh, in one step. So. You, the only thing that we sort of set up at this point was some sort of caching, like if I already ask for this data today, then don't ask again. Uh, but that was just to save some work on the on the database. But this is something that you can get uh, that you can set up very quickly. There's a few implementations uh, of uh, of data stores that can help you with this sort of workload. They they, they differ in terms of uh, the workflow. So Redshift and Snowflake are more for like data warehousing and 24/7. Runtimes, Bitcoin and Athena are 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 amazing uh, technologies where they where actually you're not paying much for storage and you're only paying for the data that's processed by the technology. So so you pay five dollars per terabyte uh, processed. If you've got your data stored as as, as columnar, you, you're only paying for the columns that you're scanning within the query. So this is very good if you're sort of if you're an analyst, you don't have DevOps team, you're only running you know some sort of uh, work on the weekends, so you save a ton of data on S3, you run a few queries, you pay one or two dollars per month, and, uh, and and you're all doing this from your laptop. So th this is an amazing solution for that kind of workload. If you if you, this is something you're doing day to day at work, uh, something like Redshift or Snowflake might be a better better fit. If you have a DevOps team and you can you can experiment, experiment a little bit more, there is um, open source solutions like um, Hive, Presto, Presto is very popular these days, or Drill, which, which offer you similar functionality to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the four technologies above. And actually, Athena from AWS is, is basically uh, rebranded Presto. So, so the great thing about this is that it works equally well for 100 meg, well, not equally well, but <laughs> it works similarly for you know, a 100 megabyte data set as, as, uh, as for a 100 gigabyte data set or even beyond in, uh, in the case of Redshift from Snowflake. The one thing to notice is that the latency will be noticeable. So if you're used to pandas and it's you know uh, results in 100, 200 milliseconds, this is not something that you're going to get. Uh, it's going to be the latency is going to be in seconds. And as I said, the pricing models are, for, are are a bit different. So some are for some some solutions are for 24/7 uh, runtime. Some some of them are for ad hoc analytics. I uh, said cached results so that you don't have to query the database uh, all the time. And uh, whilst I said that you need to run SQL, there's actually technologies like IBIS from uh, Wes McKinney, which is trying to sort of blend the two together, where you basically tell IBIS, this is my, this is my data source, read it into, uh, into my data frame. But whilst doing so, filter on, these, on this and this and do these sort of counts in a Pandas um, API, and it sort of translates that into SQL and, and executes it on your behalf. And if you set up some uh, data solution like this, it's also going to benefit your BI tools like Tableau, et cetera, because then other people can use it as well, not just you. And last but not least, I'm sort of pressed for time. Uh, this is the distributed system, which is something that's uh, been popularized in the past few years by Dask from Anaconda and uh, uh, Spark or PySpark from the Ap Apache Foundation. Um, so these are tools where they are trying to blend in the, the sort of uh, getting beefier machines and uh, and still retaining the the data frame API without having to 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 write SQL. So you're scaling horizontally, so you're getting more nodes, but you're still writing uh, the data frame API uh, code. Uh, the benefit is they can scale uh, very nicely up and down because if you get a if you scale up get a beefy, beefy machine that you need to run 24 7 that's going to get fairly expensive off peak or like at night if you don't if you're if you're like if you have like a nine to five job whereas these can just scale down to a single node overnight and and then scale up back again back again and they can even scale during query so if you've got a large query that's processing hundreds of gigabytes it can actually uh, register the pressure on on memory and cpu and just start scaling just uh, start start scaling out up until a given limit but the, I think the, be, the best benefit is that you've got the same API for a single node as, as you do for a distributed system. So you, you're writing some Spark code on your laptop, and then you're like, oh, I, I actually want to run this on my whole production data, uh, data set. So you just move this code into your, uh, into your distributed system, which could be a notebook interface. It depends on what you're running. And uh, you're not changing a single line of code. And that's not just you know, like an ad hoc. This is actually something that uh, we've done uh, very successfully. 
And the way they, these, these things work is that when you do your read CSV or read something, it's not actually, not actually reading anything. It's actually waiting for you to specify all your filters, aggregations, and UDFs and everything. And it's only when you actually want to take the, the results out of the system, so you want to print something, you want to save it into uh, a CSV or, or, some, or someplace, and at that point, the, the system triggers, uh, basically, uh, it, it try to com tries to compile a, a DAG or di di directed a, a cyclic graph of actions and tries to figure out what can, what can it parallelize, what does it need to uh, collect the data back, like in a MapReduce uh, kind of fashion. And uh, at that point, it starts executing it. So you actually you read CSV, then you write 100 lines of code, but nothing has been loaded. And only once you, you print it, uh, is it actually going to start doing some work. In terms of the architecture, uh, Spark is a Scala, so a JVM system. Uh, but it has very close integration with Python. And it, that integration has improved over the past few years, years when the authors of Spark realized that Python has grown in popularity within data science. So the Python API is actually very nice and actually allows you to uh, specify uh, UDFs and, uh, within Spark in Python. And it actually talks to the Python process back and forth. Uh, and it works quite well. Uh, opposed to that, Dask is, uh, is just Python. It's by the guys that, over at Anaconda. And it actually implements much of the uh, Python, um, much of the Pandas and NumPy API, so you can, you know, you're writing some some run-of-the-mill Pandas code, but then you just import uh, Pandas uh, or the data frame class from Dask as opposed to from Pandas, and it mostly works. So there's there are a few differences, but but the but the key is that it it it, it looks and behaves like Pandas, so it's it's very nice if you wanna if you wanna port your code to a to a cluster very quickly. So how do you get this up and running? So as of last year, you can pip install both of them, which is quite amazing for Spark, which is a bunch of jars. Uh, but they actually managed to move it up to, to PyPI, and you can pip install, uh, pip install PySpark, pip install, pip install Dask, and both of them are going to work uh, well with, uh, on your laptop. You can debug stuff. You can, you can write all your code on your laptop and then just uh, get a distributed system to, to run it if you want to scale out. There's a few solutions like uh, Amazon or AWS's uh, EMR. There's Databex, which is the, the authors of, uh, of Spark, Data Park from Google, HD Insights from Azure. So there's a, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of solutions that you can get and, uh, and get up and running within, within hours. So what to expect, as I said, there's no, there's no silver bullet. There's no one size fits all. So whilst you get uh, a lot better scaling, so there's, there's, there's few limits to that. And it's very easy to migrate from your laptop to your to a cluster. You do you do get a higher latency, as I said. It doesn't really load the, the the data up front unless you actually tell it to, which I wouldn't recommend for larger data sets. Uh, so you you do get that higher latency. So if you're used to sort of very reactive work, this is not something that you usually get in uh, in Spark or Dask. And also, it gets the debugging gets gets a bit harder because the 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 processing is not done on a, on a single node in a single process. It actually gets distributed, so it's a bit, bit difficult to gather all the instrumentation. So uh, what should you do? What should you do? So there are four solutions. As I said there's no silver bullet. And we've used every single, uh, every single one of these solutions for a different problem, and it served us very well. So I, would, I wouldn't recommend to go with one and just you know, apply to every single problem that you see. Uh, I would also think about all the costs, not just the hardware, because you know you, you can get your Athena or your BigQuery for five dollars per terabyte, but if you spend three th uh, three weeks debugging it, then you know think about the engineering costs. Um, I would also treasure simplicity, so you can get a very complicated system. So you can you can start writing very complicated code that's more efficient than uh, than pandas aggregations, uh, as I suggested in the first point. But then wouldn't it just be easier to just throw it at Dask and uh, and let it figure it out. Uh, within minutes, and this is something that um, Tom Ausberger uh, recommends in the link that I'm going to uh, just show you. And also plan, plan it carefully if you if you need some sort of collaboration. So these tools, you know, lend themselves to collaboration. Well, some of them and some some don't. So that's something to consider as well. So this is some further reading. So this is the one about scaling pandas. So this is uh, this is about Dask, and this is about you know you could write complicated code that's going to be a lot faster than pandas, but it's it might be worthwhile just to uh, just to use Dask or Spark for that. Uh, Mark Litvinchik, he he sort of uh, benchmarks a lot of the lot of the databases that are meant for analytical purposes. So like uh, all those uh, 
uh, Redshifts and click houses and uh, and BigQueries of the world, and it's it's got very nice charts and tables and all sorts, sorts of stuff, uh, and a few and a few other uh, articles and talks. I'm gonna link to the slides should be on the website uh, at some point, so you don't have to uh, note it down. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Um, if you're using Dusk and you have big data sets and you have separated your scheduler from your worker nodes, should you keep your data close to the scheduler or close to the worker nodes? Well, you should keep it closer to the work. Oh, well, uh, just to emphasize, Desk, Desk is actually the only technology that I haven't used from the <laughs> from the whole talk. But judging from the judging judging from the uh, from the way Spark works, you should you should just keep it closer to the worker nodes because those are going to be the ones that are going to be accessing the data. And uh, again, talking about Spark, uh, if it if it's for example within a Hadoop ecosystem, it knows about the co-location of the data, so so it knows about. You know, because it asks Hadoop, where is the data located, and tries to co-locate it with the with the with the execution. But uh, if you're using for so something like you know object storage like S3, it doesn't really matter because it just pulls the data uh, to your worker. But you know, in general, it should be closer to the worker because the coordinator just you know it designs the graph, it design it schedules the whole thing, and it just keeps the metrics and everything. But it it usually doesn't do uh, much of the work, if any. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Right, then uh, I would like one more round of applause for Andre.